This is the Pardoner's Tale, including the prologue to the Pardoner's Tale. Next, the doctor told a sad story. When he was done, the host said, You've made me so miserable that I almost had a heart attack. Unless I have a drink of ale, or hear something happy, my heart's lost. You, partner, my good friend, tell us some jokes. I'll do it, said the partner, but first I'll have a drink and a bite at this ale house here. The rest of the group cried out, Don't let him tell us something filthy. Let him tell us a story that teaches a lesson. We'll gladly listen to that. Agreed, said the partner, but I have to have a drink in order to think up something decent. The partner, dressed in the latest fashion, wore his long, thinned, blonde locks, carefully arranged over his shoulders. He was beardless, with eyes as bright as a hare's and a high voice like a goat's. He had just come from Rome. His pouch was full of pardons. He was so skillful at his trade that he could persuade poor country people who listened to him preach that a pillowcase was Our Lady's veil, or that a piece of sail he carried was from St. Peter's boat. He made them believe that if they bought his pardons, they'd go right to heaven when they died. He could get more silver out of poor country people in one day than an honest country parson could earn in two months. When I preach in churches, he said, I have only one subject. The love of money is the root of all evil. I preach against my own vice. Although I'm guilty of that sin, I can make other people repent of it. But that's not the purpose of my preaching. I do it only for the money. I won't work with my hands. I won't imitate the apostles. I'll have money, wool, cheese, and bread, even though the children of the poorest widow in the village are starving. But listen, you want me to tell a story. Now that I've had a drink, I'll tell you one you'll like. Though I'm a bad man myself, I can tell a moral tale. Be quiet, and I'll begin. Once, in Flanders, there lived a gang of young people who gambled and drank in brothels and taverns. Day and night they danced to harps and lutes and guitars, and they played at dice, and they ate and drank too much. Long before six, one morning, three of them sat boozing in a tavern. They heard a bell clanging in front of a corpse, being carried to its grave. One of them called out to the servant, Go ask whose corpse passes by and be careful to get the name right. Sir, said the boy, I don't have to ask. I heard his name two hours before you got here. He was an old friend of yours. Suddenly last night, sitting up on his bench, drunk as can be, he was killed. The stealthy thief people called Death cut his heart in two with a spear and went away without saying a word. He slays all the people in this country. He's killed thousands with the plague. Master, it seems to me that you, before you run to such an enemy, you'd better be careful. Be ready to meet him at any time. That's what my mother taught me. I say no more. By St. Mary, said the barkeep, the boy tells the truth. This year, in a large village over a mile from here, death has killed men, women, children, servants, and pages. I believe he even lives there. It would be wise to be careful, lest he hurt you. God's arms, cried the wastrel. Is he so dangerous to meet? By God's bones, I'll look for him in every highway and street. Listen, friends, we three have been as one. Let's swear to be one another's brothers and slay this false traitor, death. By God, he who kills so many will himself be killed this night. The three of them promised to live and die for one another as if they'd been born brothers. They rushed out in a drunken fury and started towards the village that the barkeeper had told them about. They swore terrible oaths that death would be dead if only they could find him. They hadn't gone half a mile when they came to a fence. They were about to climb over it when they met a poor old man. Humbly he greeted them. Lords, may God be with you. The proudest of the men replied, Bad luck to you, fellow. Why are you all wrapped up so only your face shows? Why did you live to be so old? The old man looked straight at him and said, Because I couldn't find a man in city or town, though I walked all the way to India, who would trade his youth for my old age. So I must remain as old as I am for as long as God wills. Death won't take my life. I walk around like a restless prisoner, knocking on the earth with my stick, crying. 
Mother, see how I waste away. When shall my bones rest? Let me in. Yet, Mother Earth won't do me that favor, so my face is turned pale and withered. But, gentlemen, it's impolite of you to speak so rudely to an old man who's neither done nor said anything to harm you. In the holy writings you can read, Stand up when you meet an old white-haired man. I give you this advice. Don't insult an old man now if you don't want to be insulted when you're old, if you should live so long. God be with you wherever you travel. Now I must go where I must go. Immediately the second gambler said, No, old fellow, not so. By St. John, you won't get away from us so easily. You just spoke of that traitor death who's killed all our friends in this country. You're his spy, aren't you? Tell us where he is, or you'll suffer for it by God's holy sacrament. You and he are working together to kill young people like us, you lying thief. Now, gentlemen, the old man replied, if you're so anxious to find death, turn up this crooked road. I left him in that grove, under a tree, and there he'll stay. May God who saved mankind save you. So said this the old man. Each of the three drunkards ran until he came to that tree. There they found nearly eight bushels of rolled gold coins. They didn't go looking for death any longer. They were so glad to see all the bright, beautiful money that they sat down by the precious treasure. The worst of them spoke first. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Though I fool around, I'm smart. Chance has led us to this treasure so that we can live our lives enjoying ourselves. We'll spend it as easily as we got it. By God's precious honour, who'd have thought we'd be so lucky? We should carry this gold to my house, or yours, because you know perfectly well it belongs to us. But we don't dare do that in daylight. People would say we're thieves and hang us up for the treasure that's rightfully ours. We have to carry it away at night as secretly and as carefully as possible. How about this? I suggest we draw lots. The one who pulls the short straw will run to town and bring back bread and wine. The other two will watch the treasure. When it's dark, we'll carry it wherever we decide best. Then one of them brought straws out in his fist and told them to draw and see which one the choice would fall to. It fell on the youngest, and he immediately rushed off to town. As soon as he was gone, one of the two remaining said to the other, You're my sworn brother. I'll tell you something that'll prove worth listening to. Here's plenty of gold to be divided among the three of us, but if I only could fix it so it were divided between us two only, wouldn't I have done you a favor like a good friend? The other replied, I don't know how you can do that. Our companion knows perfectly well the gold is here with us. How could we get it? What could we say to him? Can you keep a secret, said the first scoundrel. I'll tell you what we'll do. Well then, said the first, you know we're two, and two are stronger than one. When he sits down, you get up immediately as if you were meant to have some fun with him while you're struggling with him and playing. I'll thrust him through both sides with my dagger, and you do the same with yours. Then all this gold will be divided between you and me. We'll be able to do whatever we want and play with dice whenever we feel like it. And so, as I've told you, it's agreed between these two scoundrels to murder the third. The youngest, on his way to town, in his imagination, fingered those bright, beautiful new coins. Oh, Lord, he said, if I could have all this treasure to myself, there's no man living under God's throne who'd be as happy as I. Finally, our enemy, the devil, put it into his head that he should buy poison and kill his two friends. But the devil can destroy only those who are already on their way to damnation. He hurried into the town to a pharmacist, whom he begged for poison to put down rats. He said there was also a weasel in his yard killing the chickens. He would get revenge if he could on the vermin that attacked him at night. The pharmacist replied, I'll give you a mixture so powerful there isn't a creature in the world who wouldn't die immediately from eating or drinking an amount no bigger than a kernel of wheat. This poison is so strong that it kills in less time than it takes you to walk a mile. This criminal took the box of poison in his hand, and he ran into the next street to a man from whom he borrowed three big bottles. Into two he poured the poison. The third he kept for his own drink. He planned to work all night carrying the gold away by himself. When he'd filled the three bottles with wine, he returned again to his companions. There's no need to go on. 
Just as early as they had planned his death, so they killed him. And when that was done, one of them said, Now let's eat and drink and enjoy ourselves. Afterwards we'll bury his body. And as luck would have it, he took a poisoned bottle and drank and gave it to his friend to drink too. And of course, they were both killed. Before they died, they suffered from the most horrible symptoms of poisoning ever described in a medical book. So those murderers and this false poisoner met death. Good men, God forgive all your sins and keep you from the sin of greed. My holy pardons can save you all if you make an offering to me of gold or silver coins, or silver pins, or spools, or rings. Come on, wives, step up and give me some of your wool. I will immediately write down your names, and you shall enter the bliss of heaven. By my power I'll make those who give me money as clean and pure as the day you were born. And so, gentlemen, this is how I preach. Jesus Christ, who is a doctor of our souls, grant that you receive his pardon. That's best. I won't lie to you. But, fellow pilgrims, the partner continued, there's something I forgot to tell you. I have relics and pardons in my bag, the equal of any in England. The Pope gave them to me with his own hand. If you give me honest money, I can give you a new pardon every mile that we travel. You're lucky to have a pardoner on this trip, in case some accident should occur. One or two of you might fall off your horse or break your necks. I can absolve all of you when your souls pass from your bodies. I suggest the host be first, because he's the most sinful. Come here, sir host, and make the first offering. You can kiss every relic for a penny. Open your purse right now. No, ho, oh, no, the host cried. Christ curse me first. You'd swear your old pants were a saint's relic, though they were stained with your behind. The pardoner was so furious he wouldn't say another word. Well, said our host, I won't joke with you any more, or with any other man who doesn't know how to take it. But then the worthy knight interrupted. No more of this. Enough. Sir Pardner, cheer up.